He said, Brother Strong King, he was sobbing and weeping. He said, I have not walked like this since I was a child. His hands were in the air. He began to weep and cry even more uncontrollably and suddenly burst forth speaking with tongues. And I was there to worship and to praise the Lord with him. The muscles in his legs had become atrophied. And he suddenly stopped and said to me, he said, oh, Brother Stonking, he said, there's something tingling in my legs. He said, there is something moving in the muscles of my legs. I said to him, that is the restoration power of the Holy Ghost. God is restoring feeling and health to those muscles and to those ligaments. <clears throat> when this happened, Esther came to the altar in her wheelchair and began to worship the Lord. Please take note, I had prayed for her on Monday night. I had prayed for her on Tuesday night, as well as others that were there. Other ministers were there, and they had prayed for her also. But on Wednesday night, there was something special that seemed to come to me, a special kind of compassion for this cripple who came to the, to the altar each night in a wheelchair. And the thought kept plaguing me. People that can walk, people that are not crippled, do not make the effort that this young woman makes to get to these services, to get to this altar of prayer. Others who could walk freely did not bother to come. But how is it that this cripple in a motorized wheelchair found herself first at the altar each night? And taking all of this into consideration, having observed all of this, I went directly to her after I had prayed with this man that it had polio that I've just described to you. And there was a prayer that was anointed. There was an inspiration that came straight from the heart of God. And I prayed these wonderful words of deliverance. I say wonderful because they really were not from me. They were words of knowledge, words of wisdom that came from the Holy Ghost himself. And as I prayed these, these words that came to me by the power of the Spirit, I could feel a special kind of virtue. I call it virtue. Go out of me. I could feel faith go out of me, and I prayed a simple prayer of deliverance for her when these words began to subside in my vocabulary, and I felt the intensity of this anointed prayer begin to subside. I simply prayed in Jesus' name, and I, I left, and I walked away from her. But the glory of it all was when this man had begun to walk down the aisle, and she saw what had happened to him. Esther reached out with her hands and painstakingly, with no little effort, she pulled herself to her feet and she was standing out of this wheelchair with her hands raised to the Lord. It was in this state of her standing that I had been praying for her. And we watched this. We simply watched it. She did not walk this night. She did not walk. But at the end of the service, she was seated again in the wheelchair, and uh, she was able to get herself out of the congregation and back to the place where she was staying. In the interim, the ladies in the camp meeting had discovered that she was lying on the ground, that she was making this struggle, and they had transferred her from this tent and this ground situation into a dormitory where they could help her to dress and help her to be better and more properly cared for. So at this time, now, she was in the dormitory after two nights of sleeping on the ground and making this, this tremendous effort to be in this camp meeting. On Thursday night, the miracle really, really happened. But what happened late at night on Wednesday is what you need to hear. At the end of that service, when those of us who had been ministering left the service and went out, Esther in the dormitory had a seizure of some kind, and her pulse dropped until they could hardly find it. They called the paramedics, and they took her to the local hospital. In the hospital, the doctor was quite, quite upset, and he said, this woman is dying. He said, she will not live more than six weeks. He said, don't take her back to that campground. That only aggravates her situation with the crowd and all that goes on. He said, she needs to be placed in a nursing home immediately. This woman is dying. Esther, in her weakened condition, 
could hear the conversation and with what strength she had, she said to those Pentecostals who had accompanied her to this emergency room, she said, please do not take me away from the people of God. She said, please take me back to the campground. And so this was her wish. And the Pentecostal believers that were with her, our brothers and sisters in the Lord, granted her her wish and they brought her back to the campground and began to pray fervently with her. Suddenly, her pulse came back and she recovered from whatever had happened to her. <clears throat> On Thursday night, when the power of God fell, when the Spirit of the Lord moved into the congregation powerfully, there was just a flood of people that came to the altar and Esther was among them in her wheelchair. This night, this crippled woman, with what strength she had, began to pull at these straps and these buckles that surrounded her, her wrist and her hands and she literally, she literally yanked these braces from her hands, from her arms and she threw them to the ground and she pulled herself, she stood to her feet and began to praise the Lord. The power of God fell in that place. And I was an eyewitness to this, but she was standing worshiping the Lord and there were so many to help. And I began to minister to a young man over here who was near to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Suddenly, my back turned uh, to Esther and what she was doing. Suddenly, I heard a tremendous explosion behind me just an eruption of praise and shouting and crying out. <clears throat> and I turned to look to see what was going on, but there were so many people I really could not see. Though I took instant note that there were people on the platform, preachers were standing, waving their hands, some were weeping, people were beginning to climb up on pews and they were beginning to look, but I still could not see what was in the middle of all of this explosion, and this boy was there near to the Holy Ghost. When a friend of mine from the east here was in this camp meeting and she was standing on a pew and she sort of yelled at me above all of the praying and the altar service activity and she said, Brother Stone King, Brother Stone King, you need to see this. And I said, what is it? She said, you need to see. And I could tell by looking at her and her gesticulations that there was just a desperate joy and happiness in her. And I could feel the witness of her spirit. So I... I left this boy momentarily and I did climb on a pew and I looked over into what was happening. Suddenly, Esther had begun to walk out of that wheelchair by the power of God. And as she walked out of that wheelchair, her limbs straightened, her hands straightened, her head straightened, her whole body straightened, and she began to walk divinely healed by the power of the gifts of healing, by the laying on of hands, by the praying over, by the commanding in Jesus' name. As a result of that, this woman suddenly began to walk out of this wheelchair. And as she began to walk, she began to lead a victory march around this entire camp meeting tabernacle. Saints began to fall in behind her. People were weeping. Preachers began to fall in behind her. And they began to sing, Glory, glory, hallelujah, His truth is marching on. I have never felt the reality, the touch of the reality of Jesus Christ exactly as I felt it that night. I fell to my knees, worshiping, fervently worshiping, with thanksgiving and gratitude in my heart for such a demonstration of God, for such a manifestation of the reality of Jesus and his gospel. Esther led that victory march all around that, that tabernacle. It was absolutely glorious, absolutely wonderful what transpired there. And at the end of that service that night, Esther walked out of that tabernacle and left the wheelchair empty at the altar. It was awesome to see the wheelchair empty and its ex-victim walking out of that tabernacle, totally healed and totally normal, like everyone else. The next morning, Esther was seated in the audience on a pew, not in a wheelchair, but on a pew, 
taking notes as the Bible camp teacher was teaching the Word of God. And still before us was this empty wheelchair at the altar. That afternoon she came to choir practice. That night Esther sang in the choir. That night she danced in the spirit in that service before the presence of God and all of his holy angels and the saints of the Most High. It was absolutely tremendous. She left that campground totally healed by the power of the Holy Ghost. I have seen a number of things like this happen. God is moving in our day wonderfully and powerfully. From this realm of the gifts of the Spirit, I want to move now quickly to the working of miracles. The working of miracles has to do with many other of the gifts of the Spirit. Can you see, for example, that in order for someone to get out of a wheelchair, you might need not only the gift of faith, but the gifts of healing. You might also need the working of miracles. The point I want to get across to you is this, that in many cases when there are miracles, there is more than one gift in operation. The gifts of the Spirit are a very close-knit family, and they work together hand in hand many times to bring about a desired result. There's no doubt in my mind that what the gifts of healing, the working of miracles, faith, all of these things, even perhaps the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom that came upon me to pray the prayer that I prayed for her, that in the end result helped her to become delivered, to touch the hem of his garment as it were, to reach into the realm of faith for the supernatural. All of these things were working together to bring about this desired result. I once was in a service. There was a woman in a Sunday morning service that died in the pew. She simply died. And when she died, her family members that were in that service came running. And there was a very traumatic scene of grief. There was a registered nurse in that congregation. And this nurse came. And I was also there with the pastor. And we watched this nurse as she checked for the pulse. And there was no pulse. There was absolutely no pulse at all. And they had to hold the body up because the body slumped sideways. And they were holding her up. And people were in a state of mourning. And they were weeping. And they were crying. <clears throat> and the nurse finally said, she is gone. There is no pulse at all. And there was a blueness that began to come around the lips. And the body began to just become cold. I don't know how it was. No one really gave the signal per se. But we began to pray and to call upon the name of Jesus. There was such an intensity. There was such a determination. And we continued to pray. And the power of God began to move in. It was a small church, actually. The power of God began to move in upon that small congregation. And the reality of God became more intense and more intense and more intense. And here in our hands was a dead woman whose life had suddenly left her body. And the nurse had said, she is dead, the pulse is gone. And they were holding her up. About 20 minutes later, it was 15 or 20 minutes it took of real intense praying. But all of a sudden, and I was watching, blinking back tears, watching, watching her face, very close to her. I had a hold of her hand, her arm, praying in the name of Jesus. There were others that were praying also. I'm not saying it was my prayer. It could have been anyone's prayer. Who cares whose prayer it is as long as we receive and attain the final desired result. It does not matter who gets the credit or who does the praying. What matters is that we see it and that God receives the glory and the honor and the praise and the adoration and the exaltation for His tremendous mercy and His tremendous acts of power. That is what is important. At the end of 15 to 20 minutes, all of a sudden, the color began to come back to her lips. The natural color began to come back. And you could see life. You could see blood. You could see the effects of the blood filling her face again. And people who were watching this suddenly stopped praying. It was as if they could hardly believe it. It was as if they could hardly believe what they were seeing. And suddenly tears began to come out of her eyelids and began to run down the corners of her face and drop off and run down her neck. And her lips began to tremble. I shall never forget this. Her lips opened and I could begin to hear her speak softly in tongues. She came out of it speaking with tongues. 
God still raises the dead today. There are many accounts of the dead being raised on foreign soil at the hands of our missionaries. Not 2,000 years ago, but in this century, even in this year, miracles are taking place. Instantaneous, sudden, conspicuous healings were termed miracles in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. Instantaneous healing was termed a miracle in the scriptures. <clears throat> at the healing of the lame man at the gate beautiful, Peter simply said, such as I have, what did he have? He had the promises of God, the promises of Jesus himself. He had the Holy Ghost alive in him. He had the name of Jesus. He had faith in his own experience. And so Peter said, such as I have, Give I thee, in the name, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Immediately the man leaped to his feet and ran into the temple, worshipping and praising God. Acts 4.16 speaks of this as a notable miracle. And again, verse 22 refers to this healing as a miracle. Thus, I repeat again, instantaneous conspicuous healings are termed as miracles in the Bible. Working in miracles is the gift of the Spirit in which supernatural power is released by God through a person's life to affect a supernatural healing or happening. Throughout the Bible there are marvelous miracles like these. Rolling back of the Red Sea, the feeding of the 5,000, walking on the water by Jesus, raising the dead and many others. I know personally many people in this life who have been miraculously healed by the hand of the Lord, by the touch of God. The gifts of the Spirit, many times, I want to convey this to you without question, but you will always remember that the gifts of the Spirit, many times, do not work independently of each other or totally alone, but they work together, perhaps several of them at once, to bring the desired effect. Many people have been raised to the dead. Miracles of healing, healing from all kinds of diseases and treacheries that have been inflicted upon the people of God by demonic forces, by organic forces, sources, have been totally, totally eradicated by the intervening power of the wonderful presence of Jesus. Can you see that to raise the dead, you would definitely need the gift of faith, the gifts of healing, the working of miracles. These overlap, join hands with each other to bring about the desired results. The gifts of the Spirit are a family that is closely connected and they work together at all times for the advancement of the church. Angels are involved with the gift of faith and they are also involved with the working of miracles. In the early years of my ministry, I became extremely exhausted at one point in my life. I was in a church in Amsterdam, New York. I was preaching and I was basically exhausted. And it was a difficult spirit world atmosphere to minister in. Extremely difficult. And the weariness in my body and the struggle in the spirit world only complicated the situation. But I was doing the very best that I could for the presence of God and for the people of the Lord that had gathered and made the effort to come to this service. There was an Asian woman in this congregation. She had snow white hair. I remember her still. will always see her in my memory. A wonderful saint of God. She was seated about four rows back on the center aisle. The platform I was preaching from was sort of a terraced or leveled uh, area. And there were various levels that you could climb to or descend down to. And I suddenly walked from the upper level to the second level. When I stepped down to the second level, I happened to notice 
So I did not feel I was mightily anointed. There was not that much demonstration or response from the audience. But this white-haired saint of God, this wonderful lady of the Lord, suddenly her eyes turned red and she began to weep. She was looking steadfastly at me. Her eyes shifted to my right and to my left and she continued to weep. And I wondered what it was that caused her to weep and to respond in this fashion. At the end of the service, I was called aside by this white-haired, aged saint of God. And she told me something, and I listened, because it was something that I had never heard before. It was something that I had never been exposed to before. And later, at the end of the evening, in the pastor's home, the pastor's wife came to me and she said, Brother Stone King, I noticed that uh, Sister So-and-So called you aside and she spoke to you. Would you mind telling me what she told you? I said, no, I wouldn't mind at all. I would be happy to tell you. And so I began to tell her what this sister had spoken to me. And the pastor's wife became emotional and she said, Brother Stone King, that woman is a prophetess. Whatever she has told you is true. And whatever she has told you will come to pass. And I had never heard anyone say anything like this. I had never been exposed to a quote-unquote prophetess. I had never come in contact in those early, early years of my ministry with anyone that operated like this or professed such a position or professed such things. But what this dear sister had told me was this. She said, Brother Stone King, when you step down to that second level, she says, suddenly there were two men robed in white that appeared on either side of you, and they were discussing you. And she said, suddenly one reached over and touched you on your right shoulder. She said, when he touched you on your right shoulder, she said, the other one also touched you. And she said, I knew that God had sent his angels to minister to you, to give you strength. And immediately at the end of the service when she told me this, I became aware of the fact that from the moment I had noticed her crying, there was a strength that came to my body. And I began to think in the house after the service, the weariness is gone. Something has happened to me. And from that point on, I recovered from this exhausted state. And I was able to carry on with fervor and power and, and personal power in my thrust as I preached the gospel and carried on evangelistic work in those days. It was at that point I became a believer in the manifestation of angels of God. And I took to heart the fact that angels are really ministering spirits and that they come to minister to the heirs of salvation. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, it talks about angels. It talks about angels are ministering spirits to the heirs of salvation. And with that thought in mind, I want to proceed into an area which I trust will prove to be a great blessing to you and a tremendous benefit as you continue to walk with God, that there will be supernatural happenings in your life, that you will begin to believe in the ministry of angels and that you will see how beautifully, how intricately designed the kingdom of God is and how many things, if I may call them things, there are available to the saints of God to fight a victorious warfare and to carry on with power and confidence in the work of God despite the world conditions, despite the news media, despite the isms and the schisms, despite the occult and the so-called revival of the occult, that you will be encouraged, that you will be strengthened more than you have ever been strengthened in this particular area. I want to simply discuss now with you a subject entitled Ministering Spirits because angels are connected with the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. I sat down not long ago and took my Young's Analytical Concordance and I counted over 275 references to angels. I then reached for my Strong's Exhaustive Concordance and I counted over 500 references to angels in the Word of God. 
angels are mightily involved in the affairs of men more than we have ever fully realized God has used angels to do his work from Genesis to Revelation men of old saw angels conversed with them for it was angels that went before them fought battles for them delivered them from their enemies cared for them God sent angels among the people to bless, to curse, to destroy, to kill, and to heal. He has had angels all down through the ages as ministering spirits to perform His will. Angels blessed, they cursed, they killed, they made alive. Why? Because angels are created beings. They do nothing but carry out the commandments of God. They stand in waiting for commands from the Lord to be sent to minister on behalf of God himself and the heirs of salvation. I believe that the commands from God to angels are brought about by the prayers of the saints of God who are pleading for help, who are pleading for answers, who are pleading for divine interventions. I believe that God send ange sends angels into our lives to carry out these functions and these performances. Angels drove Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. In Jacob, in Genesis chapter 48 and verse 16, on his deathbed, Jacob made reference to the angel which redeemed him from all evil. Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord until the break of day and was blessed. In Exodus chapter 23 and verse 20, God told Moses, he said, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Verse 21, the Bible goes on to say, God speaking, Beware of him. In other words, beware of this angel of mine and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Angels then, according to this scripture, travel in the name of the Lord. Therefore, is it possible that every time we cry out the name of Jesus, that every time we call upon the name of Jesus, that angels begin to move in response to the name of Jesus being invoked? I believe it is possible, I believe it is true, that angels snap to attention when the name of Jesus is mentioned, I can feel angels, for example, in this studio room, in this recording room. They've been here all through this day because the word of God has been preached. And I am believing tonight that angels will go out from this classroom, out from this recording studio, into your home, into your classroom, that you will feel the presence of of angelic beings that will open your understanding and will bring revelation to you, that will minister to you as you study the Word of the Lord, and in particular, the gifts of the Spirit that are being taught in this session. Verse 22 goes on to say, God speaking to Moses, But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. For mine angel, Moses, shall go before thee. That is powerful, friend. That is powerful. The angel of the Lord went before Moses and the ad admonitions and instructions that God gave were absolutely powerful. At Sodom and Gomorrah, Two angels left the tent of Abraham, leaving the theophany of God behind, while they went to deliver Lot and his family out of judgment that was coming. The angels of the, of the Lord in this case actually took Lot by the hand and led him and his family out.